Hello. Hi. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm good. Sorry, I'm a little late. No, it's no problem. All right, man. Let me step into my office here and uh, close the door. Tell me a little bit about what we're doing. Well, I can just kind of jump around then with your career so far. It's not only focused on one certain thing. Okay. And the uh, first thing I can ask is um, in terms of acting, is what is what inspired you was seeing uh, Joseph and the Technicolor Dream Coat when you were a teenager? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, that is it. I went to New York with my parents when I was 15, and uh, they took me to a Broadway show, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dream Coat. And, and uh, I saw that, and we had an amazing time. It was an amazing show. I think it was closing week. It was just phenomenal. The energy was unbelievable. And we were on a big family trip and the entire rest of the trip, that was the first part of it. And the entire rest of the trip, I was just going, mom, dad, I want to be an actor when I grow up. I want to be an actor. I want to be an actor. And they're just like, but fine, whatever. And I was relentless. I was just mom, dad, I want to be an actor. So I think of it like a kid tugging at your, your parents' coattail, just, hey, dad, hey, dad. And it's like, finally, they're like, what? I was like, I want to be an actor. And they're like, Oh my gosh, John, no, you can't in, go do anything. Don't be an actor. And they finally just relented. And <clears throat> I said, uh, they wanted me to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, failure is not an option. There is no plan B. Um, this is what I want to do. And that's what I ended up doing. And was there ever um, any uh, initial aspiration once your career got started to move to L.A.? Oh, yeah, for sure. In fact, I did move to L.A. for a little bit. I lived there um, in the early 90s uh, in West Hollywood for a very short period. I mean, like three months. And uh, I was actually roommates with a comedian named Janine Garofalo. Oh, wow. And he was running around with Andy Dick and Bob Odenkirk and Ben Stiller and the like and uh, Mark Marin. Yeah. You know, all these guys before any of them were really, you know, huge like they are now. And um, it, was, it was really cool, you know. And then when I moved back and then they all started hitting it, I was like, oh, man. Yeah. I can say I knew them when. But, um, and another one uh, that I met was uh, Mike Henry, the voice of Cleveland. Yeah. And we became friends out there. So um, anyway, yeah, it was a very short stint. But I'm glad I moved back. I mean, I met my wife here. I, you know, have kids now. And I'm, you know, I, I you know, certainly think about, God, I wish I would have stayed and, all that, but you know, your acting is it's a weird career, man, and you never know where it's going to take you. And this is just where mine took me, so mm -hmm. I'm uh, grateful for the opportunities that I've, I've had. And in terms of uh, on camera, was um, Pair of Aces your first experience? Um, yes, uh, for film, um, that was actually even before I moved out to LA, uh, I was here in Texas and uh, auditioned for this movie. I'd been doing some comedy theater around town and really felt like sketch comedy was what I wanted to do and then auditioned for this uh, movie called Pair of Aces and ended up getting cast and was up shooting in Austin for like three weeks with Willie Nelson and uh, another uh, wonderful actor named Sonny Carl Davis um, who uh, he was he's kind of a local or not local but he's a, a famous kind of a famous Texas actor uh, and uh, he you know, kind of showed me the ropes and took me under his wing a little bit. And, you know, I thought, oh man, this is it. We're in business. And he was actually living in LA at the time. <clears throat> and uh, he was like, yeah, John, you got to move out here, man. I mean, you just did this film, you know, it's, it's a good movie. You did a good job and, and now's the time to go. And of course I didn't, I waited, but um, <clears throat> I did go back out to LA and uh, finally and, and came back. But then once I was back, uh, I started landing more movies here. I mean, I never really did anything when I was in L.A., mm -hmm. except some voiceover work, oddly enough. And uh, I'd, when I got back, I'd, I did work on Dazed and Confused and Eight Seconds and a few TV, you know, cable movies and stuff like that and doing a lot of commercials and such. And I thought, golly, man, I think I made the right choice moving back to Texas, you know. But uh, like I said, I'm, I'm glad I did, and I'm glad of kind of where I am now. Mm -hmm. Was that was that was uh, Aces also how you got into SAG, or was that a separate story? 
Uh, I am not in SAG now. That is how, though, I did go. I did get into SAG through that movie, yes. But in Texas, you don't have to be in SAG. Yeah. And uh, so I only joined, and I know if you're a union member, a lot of people would take issue with this, but I only joined because I was moving to L.A. But in Texas, it's a right-to-work state. So you can do union and non-union work and not be in the union. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but if you if you go to, like, New Mexico – you have to join the union. If you have to, if you go to other places, you know, that are union states, you have to join. So I just didn't have to. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is the case where you've um, been the most starstruck with who you were working alongside of? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that. I mean, I, you know, when I worked on Days and Confused, I worked with uh, Mia Jehovah and, um, uh, I didn't work with him, but like, you know, that was Matthew McConaughey's first film and uh, Ben uh, Affleck is in it and Adam Goldberg, just, you know, a ton of stars that are stars now. They weren't really stars back then. Either the Willie Nelson movie or when I did Eight Seconds uh, working with Luke Perry. Mm -hmm. That that was really cool. I know you got to do something on uh, Ray, too. Uh, yeah, I, I worked on Ray uh, with Jamie Foxx, but that was interesting because I was only on it for a short time, and um, uh, Jamie Foxx was so into being Ray, like, you know, he had his eyes glued shut so he really couldn't see, yeah. uh, and, and on the set, you know, when in between uh, shots, you didn't go up to him and go, hey, Jamie, I'm a big fan, or, you know, whatever, it was like, he was Ray. Yeah. And so you had to address him as Ray. It was just part of his his process and his method, you know, and you got to respect it. So um, that was, I, I wasn't really, you know, awestruck. I was just like, well, I can't even go talk to him. So, oh, well. I would, I guess when I was in LA, you got some uh, interaction with uh, Sam Kinison too, before he died. Uh, no, I actually uh, got to, uh, I didn't really work with him. But I got to meet Sam Kennison here in Houston at a place called the Comedy Workshop. And um, man, you guys say you've really done your homework. <laughs> um, I uh, auditioned for my very first professional acting job was a, at a place called the Comedy Workshop here in Houston. It's a, a couple of folks from Minneapolis used to work at Dudley's Brave New Workshop, which was a improv comedy sketch comedy theater. They moved down here to Houston and started a theater in the 70s. It was wildly successful. And so when I um, graduated from college and moved back, I was like, man, I got to, that's what I want to do. I discovered improvisation uh, in college. A group from Second City had come through and I saw their show and I was blown away. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I found it. This is it. And, uh, you know, my ultimate dream was to, you know, audition and go to Second City and then go off to Saturday Night Live and, and do that. But that was a, a much more, proved a little more difficult than I thought the plan was. But anyway, uh, but I started working at the Comedy Workshop and I'll never forget the very first show I was cast in uh, was the first show I auditioned for. And I got cast in a show and we would write our own show. So it's not like we're doing this play. I mean, it, we would write our own stuff. First day of rehearsal, uh, Sam Kennison walks in to talk to the owner of the club. And I was just like, what? Wow, that's cool. <laughs> so I was, uh, and then he would come through periodically um, uh, to do shows. And he'd always stop by the workshop and, you know, throw a big party and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And I know that with, uh, in terms of, anime voiceover it started with golden boy but um was the first like major part that you got to do a lot with was in bubblegum crisis yeah yeah that was probably the first bigger role i had and it was it was interesting because when i when i started doing anime i truly had no idea what it was i didn't know anything from anything i was like you know what is this why does everybody have blue hair why is it spiky you know what what's going on. And I didn't really realize how um, awesome it was. Um, but I, I did realize, especially with like bubble gum 
director from uh, Golden Boy uh, and some of the other shows, it's like, some of this is like really heavy. This isn't just crazy, wacky, silly stuff, you know? This is uh, some drama and it's got some, I, I was like, man, you can really stretch your acting wings here. This is fun. Uh, and and Bubblegum was certainly one of those shows where I got to do that um, and uh, really um, get to experience that kind of, uh, that style of acting. Well, what do you think is the case where you've had to get the uh, darkest emotional headspace for? Those are those are the most challenging. I mean, you know, when you've got to really get, uh, like I was just doing My Hero. Yeah. Uh, it was last year, but it was the fifth season. And I uh, was telling Colleen Carroll, the director, I was like, man, I was recording this. And I was like, golly, this stuff, man. I've never felt this way doing an anime you know i've never been affected like this yeah and it was good it was just some powerful stuff you know um also for me for all for one it was a lot more meat in the scene sometimes you know when you're the bad guy especially with somebody like all for one like when he first started out everything was just somebody telling giving him a report and he just goes very well then <laughs> no, that was it you know there was no uh, big thing of course when he fought All Might that was big but this last season and I think in season six I mean it's not a spoiler or anything but I think in season six I don't know but I think it, it's going to get really really crazy and I'm really looking forward to uh, kind of all hell breaking loose Yeah, but definitely doing those darker characters is a lot more fun you know doing uh, we just wrapped you know, about a year ago, did uh, redid Gendo from yeah. uh, Evangelion for uh, Amazon. And, I, you know, it was such a blast to revisit that, even though I'd done it. Um, it was just so fun to, you know, take him down that path again and just, you know, you got this and the imagery and stuff. I mean, like one of the shots that comes to mind is, He's, he's in his office and you can't even really tell it's an office. It's just, it takes up the whole screen and it's this long shot and he's at his desk and Shinji is way over here and they're just having this conversation, you know, and it's like the, the, the distance between the two, just that visual distance speaks volumes, you know, it's like, I know your place, you know your place, stay in your place. And it is not near me, even though you are my son. <laughs> and you're going to do what I tell you to do. I know there's, um, of course, a lot of like emotional confliction going on with uh, Hohenheim, too. Yeah, yeah. N another great example. Um, you know, just sit, you, you sit there and you're conflicted about being good. And we were, Eric Vale and I were talking about this. And it's like, you know, what does it mean to be a bad guy? And really, the bad guys just don't think what they're doing is bad. Mm -hmm. Or if they do, if it is bad, if they know it's bad, they don't care enough to go, I really shouldn't be doing this. It's like, no, this is what I want. This is what I'm going to do to get what I want. It's that simple. And um, when you have a inner struggle of good trying to maybe poke its head out and make itself be known that's where a real the real struggle can can be found mm -hmm. and that's i think that's the case with owen i'm you know there's even with genda i mean there's like just an inkling of redeeming quality you know that you kind of got to latch on to it mm -hmm. and go uh you know what okay maybe it wasn't as bad as we thought all for one i don't think is in that category at all yeah well this is a, a more good character but um the series has a lot of tragedies in it um peacemaker you played uh isami yeah that's an older one I, I don't to be honest with you i don't remember as much about that one um but uh i'm sure i had fun doing it so yeah sorry about that no it's okay lame -o answer <laughs> well who do you think that you um personally relate the most to 
as characters. Well, first of all, I don't think I'm a crappy dad, so it's tough. I play a lot of bad guys and a lot of dads. and Sometimes they're the same guy. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, I actually, if I had to relate to somebody, it's also happens to be one of my favorite roles is uh, Kumitetsu from The Boy and the Beast. Yeah. It's a Masada movie. And I just love it because he's he's got this hard edge that he puts on. But inside, he's just a big teddy bear. And he just, you know, given the chance, he wants to love. He wants to respect and have respect. But, um, and I, not that I'm hard on the outside, but I do think I've got that teddy bear quality. So, um, but that's probably one that I, I relate to the most. Mm -hmm. What about with uh, like Mr. Death? A character like that <laughs> or death is i mean more death is fun i just you know i love doing him you know he's 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 hilarious and that was just such a, a fun romp you know uh i mean it's you know not that i really relate to him or anything he's just he's you know all the the dads and stuff that i played you know even if they're um good or bad or whatever you know they they've they, uh, they all seem to have a level of control that is important to them. Mm -hmm. I think as human beings, we all have that quality. You know, we want control over our destiny, over our lives. And it always floors me, especially with bad guys. You know, no, no matter whatever happens to a bad guy, it's like that was supposed to happen. It's all part of my plan. You know, even though it doesn't look like it on the surface, you know, and it's like, um, it reminds me of that scene in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I don't know if you ever saw that, but <laughs> there's a, a, a scene where um, this guy, Raz, who's kind of a nerd, his uh, buddy is uh, who thinks he's super cool, is trying to give him some advice but on his, for his first date. And, but one of the things he gives, I think, is actually very good advice. And he goes, always remember, wherever you are, that's the place to be. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what? That's actually very sound advice, you know. It, and it's, it's, you can extrapolate it a gazillion ways, you know, but it's like, do the best with what you've got where you are. I mean, you know, it was Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, you know, don't covet other things, you know, be happy with what you've got kind of stuff and make the most of it. You know, don't wish and spend your time wishing for that and that. It's and it's like um, I think that um, you know the the bad guys certainly have a good way of doing that. They things don't go their way, and it's just like yes, well, that's not a problem. That's exactly as I expected. It's like they've always got a contingency plan. That's like no problem. Plan B automatically kicked in when that happened, and we're good. To, we're back on track. You know, so. Mm -hmm. that, kind of fun what is your personal um opinion on uh, undertaker then well he is uh, certainly one of my favorite characters to play i i love uh his dynamic especially in book of atlantic um you know just being that kind of crazy happy you know what's he gonna do you know where what's gonna happen here and then it's just like, you know, those suddenly the gloves come off and he's like, you're everyone's like, oh my gosh. Uh, ah. And that was so much fun. Ian Sinclair directed me in that. Ian is such a, such a talented uh, actor and director, but we just had so much fun doing that. Um, I wish they'd bring it back. Yeah. You know, there, there, there's, a, there's several roles I wish they'd bring back. I mean, obviously, you know, Gendo and Hohenheim, they're, but, um, you know, things like Lord Death and Soul Eater, um, Undertaker and Black Butler and, you know, a couple others. I'm just like, you could bring them back if you wanted to. You know, there's, I get people ask me all the time. It's like, are they going to do more Soul Eater? And I'm like, I don't know. I wish they would. I don't know why they don't. It seems to be a very, very popular character and a popular, very popular show. Matter of fact, I tell people all the time when I'm at conventions and stuff, people are like, 
you know, they're not just getting autographs for all for one. They're it's probably all for one. Well, it's kind of across the board. You know, I've never really done a a study and uh, statistical, you know, com- comparison of what do I sell most of. It actually even changes from show to show. Mm-hmm. But um, certainly, you know, I'm replenishing my prints for uh, uh, all for one for um, uh, Soul Leader and for um, uh, Undertaker quite a bit, you know. Yeah. But also for Crocodile from One Piece and you know, <laughs> when I'm and I mean, it just it really just depends. You know, everyone's got their favorite, which is really cool. But anyway, I think that uh, Full Metal and Soul Leader are um i get a lot of people going dude that was my first show i grew up on that show that's what got me into anime and i'm like yeah they're kind of gateway animes you know they they get people hooked because they're fun and they're entertaining and they're good stories you know and that's at the end of the day man i don't care you know you can talk about characters all you want at the end of the day if it's a good story it's a good story and that's what that's what hooks us in Mm -hmm. i think that's what uh, stands out too. I don't know if people really bring it up with you much anymore, but um, Claymore, you played Isley. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was a fun show. Um, yeah, there's a there's a bunch of them like that. I mean, one of my favorites was uh, an anime called Moby Dick. Yeah, and I Captain Ahab, and it's a you know a space version. I mean, it's not they're not out in the Atlantic in the 1600s or whatever they're you know often they're space pirates and stuff but to you know getting to do a character like that that's and that's always fun you know when people is a little off topic though but when when people ask about you know how do I get into voiceover and stuff like that you know the main thing about doing voiceover is being yourself being you know an actor first and and what can you do with the instrument you've got but Man, it's always fun when you get to do a character like a Lord Death or a, you know, Soul Eater uh, or Undertaker or Crocodile, you know, and because people go, well, I see what you're saying, but that's not really your, you know, it's hard to believe you can do all, you know, it's hard to believe that the guy that did Lord Death is also the guy doing all for one. (laughs) And I'm like, well, I've just been very lucky and blessed in that department, but um that's where it really gets fun is when you can do some fun voices and really, really create a character. It's kind of more technical uh, related to that, but what do you think is the case where you've had to um, alter your voice the most significantly? But Lord Death is certainly an alteration. Um, Crocodile is just growly. Salvador from Borderlands 2 is, you know, Russian Ecuadorian. I don't know what he is, you know, but he's, he's just got that big voice to this voice that talks like this you know so uh, that was probably the hardest on my voice was that character that's the one that took the most toll i know it's a uh, quite a while ago too but um your character in kaleido star is a lot on like physically unlike a lot of characters that you would think that you would play <laughs> yeah um <clears throat> ken was one of those roles i think uh, when reviews came out about that show, everything got a great review except my voice because oh. that's, you know, it sounds like he's forcing it. Sounds like it's, you know, it's not, that's not him. I mean, it's, it's me, but it's me feigning something. And, and truth be told, um, it was, you know, my voice isn't up here. I can't do that. You know, that's just, especially now, but even back then, yeah, it just was a stretch for me. And I, it, it was my finest performance, but, um, you know, I just, I, there's certain people, certain voices you have in your wheelhouse and that was not it. That was out in the pasture somewhere that I had no business being in. Mm-hmm. It looks like there's been a number of instances too, where you've gotten to, uh, perform with yourself or at least play like tons of different incidental characters. Yeah, I've, I've had to do that. That's that's fun. And sometimes by design and sometimes by pure accident. But um, yeah, it's just, you know, as long as you can, uh, you know, try to sound different. You know, back in the early days of, of recording, there just weren't that many actors doing it. So you might have a Greg Ayers or uh, 
Chris Patton or Vic Mignogna or somebody like that that could do. Um, they were they were the trope, you know, the the hero kind of guy. And uh, myself and John Gremion and and others were all the bad guys, you know. And so we had to do a lot of different a lot of different voices to. Uh, and then you know, every now and then it'd be like, oh, so uh, you remember that guy you did in uh, episode three? Well. <clears throat> Uh, you're doing another character in episode eight, and uh, he ends up having a conversation with that guy. So good luck. So, you know, you just try to hopefully make sure it's as different as possible. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's you're looking at two different characters. They may sound similar, but I don't think you're just going, wait a minute, that's the same guy. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you can I think people can suspend that uh, belief for a little bit and even if they sound somewhat similar and, and, you know, especially with girls, man, I listen and I, you know, direct and everything and I'll cast people and I'll, you know, listen to the final product. I'm like, golly, man, those those girls all sound the same, you know, (laughs) that's that's kind of, that's weird, but they're not, they're all different, you know, and they all do a great job. It just, you kind of just hear that, that same, same timber, you know, if you will. Has there been a case where um, you played a major character in a series that you were directing to? No. Um, I've done some fairly good sized roles. I, I, if, if that something like that were to happen, it would be purely um, an accident. Like uh, uh, I took over a show that I was in because the director moved on left the business, you know, whatever, and I'm directing it, but I had already been that character. But like as a director, I would never cast myself as a lead. Yeah. Major character. It's just it's number one, it's a little narcissistic in my opinion, but it's uh also it's too much to do. I mean there's there's you know way too much else to pay attention to than to be the lead. And I I you know it, it's very hard to direct yourself because you're, you know, when, when we're directing other actors, I get to listen to what the actor's choices are. And then I can alter those choices. I can, Hey, listen, I need you to say the line a little differently, or maybe say it like this or like that, um, or just leave it alone. Let the actor's choice be the right one. I mean, you know, it's not, not that there's a right or wrong way. It's just sometimes they don't understand the context of a scene they're doing because they haven't, been privy to the entire show very very difficult to do that on your own and be subjective Mm -hmm. or objective objective subjective one of the objectives Um, and you know you need to be you need to be able to step away so usually if something like that happened like i did um i did a show called vinland saga yeah that i did with kyle jones who's a a, one of my dear friends just a, a very gifted and brilliant individual i've known him for years we co-directed the show it's a huge show and he wanted me to be Leif Erickson and I said okay that's fine but you got to direct me I can't direct my own session and he was like yeah that's fine so uh you know he would direct me and there were some times where I made a decision and he was like hey let's let's try this and I had to go, okay, I would, uh, you know, say, well, that's, that's really the choice I'd make, but I have to trust him because he's the director, you know, so. Well, is there anything else that's um, upcoming that you're a part of that you can safely talk about? Uh, well, I mean, the only thing I'm really doing right now is uh, uh, working on a, sh- well, no, I can't. <laughs> I really, no, I can't because they're, they're, they're not out yet. Well, my final question then is always asking, uh, what do you want your legacy to be? Oh, my legacy. Well, you know, my daughter's into uh, voice acting. My son is into voice acting. Um, he loves anime. Um, you know, I just, uh, I just hope that people, you know, really enjoy the work that I've done and, and look back on it as uh, fond memories of their life. You know, I've, I've, you know, every now and then you get people that'll come up and they'll say things to you like, you know, you you had a profound effect on my childhood or, you know, you you helped me get through some very rough times and dark times in my life. And, 
and I identified with a certain character and your voice really embodied, you know, that and it got me through the tough times. And um, so, uh, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that just means the world, you know, there's you can't put a price tag on it. You can't, you know, put any kind of value on it because it's so personal and so such an emotional charge for me. And I know other voice actors do. I, I guarantee you they'd say the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, when you say somebody, you know, somebody, someone comes up to you and go, you know, um, I was in the hospital because I tried to commit suicide and, and listening and watching your character uh, change my whole life and my whole outlook. You know, um, I mean, that's, that's awesome. And it's, you know, really, uh, it's nothing that I've done uh, per se. I didn't go out there and go, well, I'm going to go save people, you know, but what it did do that, you know, my performance had an effect on a positive effect on somebody. And that is, um, that's just awesome. I mean, there's no better feeling in the world than that. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks. I'm glad that we got to do this. Well, I am too, Chris. Thank you so much, man. And sorry, I got to run, but <laughs> I need to get on dinner. And uh, I wish you all the best. And thanks again. I'm sure I'll see you when you're up here for the convention in Minneapolis in like a few weeks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Be sure to say hello, man. I'd love to see you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Bye-bye.